Welcome to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Gareth Jones. Gareth is a fellow of the Center for Management Development at London Business School and a visiting professor at Spain's IE Business School in Madrid. Gareth and co-author Rob Jaffe consult to the boards of several global companies, and today we'll be discussing their book, Why Should Anyone Work Here? Gareth is a true leadership and organizational guru, so let's ask him five good questions. Welcome back to the program, everybody. My guest today is Gareth Jones, author of Why Should Anyone Work Here? Gareth, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It's a pleasure. So let's jump right in. Um, question number one, this, your book is really all about building authentic organizations, and authenticity is this big buzzword right now. Why is it so important that we try to create authentic organizations? Okay, well, let me tell you a little bit, Jake, about the history of the book. Uh, a little while ago, we wrote another book called uh, Why Should Anyone Be Led By You? And its conclusion was that in order to be a more effective leader, you needed to be yourself more with skill. So it argued that authenticity was a necessary but insufficient condition for the exercise of leadership. A bit different, actually, from the American version of authenticity, which comes very close to saying, be yourself. Uh, and in our view, you need to be yourself skillfully. <laughs> be a better version of yourself. <laughs> you need to be the best version you can be. Yeah. Um, so our kind of meta skill would be situation sensing, the ability to read situations and to act appropriately. Um, and that message, I think, has resonated uh, rather well, and the book sold extremely well. But one rational response to it was, well, okay, Gareth, I'll be an authentic leader when I work in an authentic organization. But since I don't, I'll go on being the same political player I've been for the last 15 years. So about five years ago, we started to ask people, what would an authentic organization look like? Uh, and this book, the new book, Why Should Anyone Be Led By, uh, Why Should Anyone Work Here, reports the findings of that research. Exactly. And so what uh, <clears throat> did, uh, is there one of the big like uh, buzzwords also is kind of engagement. Is that really what we're hoping to get when we have, when we're part of authentic, it, do we just get better engagement when we have authentic uh, leadership and authentic organizations? Uh, well, I think we do, but um, when we wrote uh, an article in Harvard Business Review called Creating the Best Workplace on Earth, uh, and the book, the new book, is based on that article, a rather shrewd senior Ooh. GE executive uh, sent us a lovely email which said, you've taken the engagement debate and m moved it on to a whole new level. Because engagement's been a buzzword in HR and organizational development for about 10 years. Um, guess what? Engagement scores aren't going up. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty low, actually, viewed globally. I mean, there are some cultural variations, but in general, many, many people are disengaged with their work. And in our view, that's a colossal waste of talent and productivity. Yeah, it's, I've seen some of those numbers before, and it's actually shocking. It almost makes you wonder, why do you even go to work in the morning? <laughs> Well, I, I suppose that the, the rather worrying thing, especially for big organizations, is people are in danger of falling out of love with organizations. And uh, the latest wave of corporate scandals, perhaps most spectacularly VW, yeah. has helped, hasn't helped. Now, if you're Diageo or GlaxoSmithKline or General Electric or Sony, and people are falling out of love with big organizations, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have a talent problem. You're going to have a talent problem. And yeah. that's, I guess what we're saying is, if you can build organizations where people feel really committed to what they do and connected to what they do, they're likely to be very successful organizations. So for question number two, I was hoping that you could walk us through the, the DREAMS framework that you create from this book. And that's, uh, you know, DREAMS is an acronym for different words that uh, kind of embody this, this style of organization. Uh, could, you, could you just give us, a, you know, you don't have to go into everything, but... Just give us Everybody kind of an overview. Let's talk you through the letters quickly. Yeah. E. D stands for difference beyond diversity. So people said to us, I want to work in an organization where I can be myself. Now, the conventional diversity agenda is, of course, very important. Um, how many women, how many ethnic minorities, how many gay people, and so on. Very, very important. But what people were talking to us about is something different. 
the ability to be themselves. So that's D, R, radical honesty. Tell me the truth before someone else does. Because our view is that in a world of WikiLeaks and social media and Twitter and whistleblowing, guess what? The age of corporate secrets is over. Yeah, you can't hide. Tell me the truth before someone else does. E, extra value. Add value to me, don't exploit me. So I want to be developed and I think this is a lovely win-win situation because of course as you develop your employees they add more value to you. So it's a win-win. A. Authenticity. Mean what you say and say what you mean. Don't rewrite the mission statement every two years when another firm of consultants comes in. Yeah. M. Meaning. I want a meaningful job in an organization which itself has meaning. S, perhaps the hardest of all, simple, agreed rules, not a fog of bureaucracy. Now, those things, I think, taken all on their own, uh, unob unobjectionable. People would say, well, these are kind of obvious, Gareth. Well, <laughs> we couldn't find a single organization that had all of them. So we need to ask ourselves, why are organizations unable to deliver on this agenda, um, the organization of your dreams? Yeah, one of the things I liked about the book was that you had these, uh, you could basically kind of give your employees this test um, and figure out kind of where they are on the continuum of each of these, uh, you know, these ideas to see how, how, how close are they to maybe the ideal um, in each of these categories, uh, which I thought was... I mean, a huge value add. Good. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you found the diagnostic useful. I mean, I think it's very, very important when organizations are considering these issues is to know exactly where they're starting from. And in fact, we've tried to be uh, pragmatic and helpful in our advice on each of these topics because it's quite hard to do them all at once. Right. Uh, so do the diagnostic. Pick a couple of areas where you think you really need to do some work. Get an action plan and put a time frame in. And then take the measurement again. Um, and remember, this is a kind of continuous process. Right. Uh, I, I think what our research shows is that really great organizations are sort of constantly dissatisfied with where they are. They never feel like they've fixed everything. Um, so an organization which we talk about rather positively in the book is Novo Nordisk. It's one of the world's, it is the world's largest supplier of insulin, and I think it's now the seventh largest pharmaceutical company in the world. Its chief executive, Lars Rabian Sorensen, has just been voted the best CEO in the world in the Harvard Business Review. Well, that's pretty remarkable, actually, for a Danish company, even though it's a global Danish company now. But one of the things that characterizes Novo Nordisk is a sort of sense of dissatisfaction, a kind of idea that you always need to improve, and indeed they score rather well on many of these dimensions. But they really struggle with difference. Mm. The top of the company is dominated by Danish males. Yeah. And they, they really struggle with difference. So even there, and they understand that, by the way, and they make some moves to make some changes and so on. But I don't think it's ever a question of feeling satisfied that we've cracked this forever. In a way, it's kind of like an agenda. It's sort of like a manifesto. Um, by the way, if you did create these great places to work, you would do well. You would become a beacon for talent and you would find yourself retaining your talent better than the competition. Yeah, and I think that's the maybe the hard part uh, with there's so much short-termism and this is really an investment in your people to get the most out of them and to make sure that they're happy in the long term. And if you're kind of, or if you're aiming from quarter to quarter, this all just kind of looks like expenses and not so much like investment. And I think that that can be an issue perhaps with, um, you know, maybe especially smaller organizations. Well, I, I agree with you entirely. In fact, the organizations that we praise the most in the book are Novo Nordisk, which a fair chunk of its uh, shares are held by a foundation. Uh, Ove Arab, the consulting engineers, which is a partnership. And Waitrose, a UK retailer, which is effectively a cooperative. Now, since the crash of 2008, I think it's fair to say that capitalism faces the challenge of reinventing itself. And capitalism has a good track record at being successful at this. But I'm not sure 
that being trapped in the world of quarterly reporting is an agenda for long-term sustainable success. I couldn't agree more with that. So question number three, and this is kind of just shifts gears a little bit to throw a little fun in. Do you think that you could apply this dreams framework to organizations outside of business? And I was thinking specifically maybe the, the family unit at home. <laughs> well, well, you could, but I, I uh, would caution you in using the diagnostic. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I have three children and I, I always say that when you have more than one child, you realize the limits of genetics. Uh, because they're all different yeah. and your task as a parent or one of your tasks as a parent I think is to allow them to express their individuality and not to turn them into clones of mum and dad um, and that's a bit of a challenge of course because you know the mum and dad are the power at least initially the powerful ones and it's very easy for you to find yourself in a situation where you impose yourself on others um, I, I rather like the homely remark that children need uh, strong roots and strong wings. Mm, yeah, I like that. So question number four, um, <clears throat> and this is, is uh, I'm going to start with a quote from one of the founders of Visa, a guy named D. Hawk, um, and I'll read it to you real quick. Simple, clear purpose and principles give rise to complex and intelligent behavior. Complex rules and regulations give rise to stim simple and stupid behavior. Um, I, just, I find that really fascinating. I love the part about having some simplicity to the rules in your, uh, your organization. Can you talk a little bit more about how, how important that is and why it's important? Oh, it's, it's, I love the quote, by the way, and I agree with it 100%. Um, in fact, the, when we were doing the field work for this book, the thing which got people most angry was their organizations being characterized by a kind of you know, a miasma, a fog of bureaucratic rules, most of which they didn't know why the rules existed. And of course, what we've discovered is that when people are, are faced with a, a, a complexity of rules, they become really good at gaming the system. Right. Whereas what we're aiming for is not organizational anarchy where people can do what the hell they like, but simple, agreed rules which we really understand. And we know why we're following them. So in the book, we draw a distinction between systematization, good. It's when, especially when organizations grow and get bigger, they need to systematize. And that's when you know what the rules are for. And bureaucratization, where you get rule creep and mock rules and, and people just following the rules without knowing why they're doing it. And then you get dysfunctions. And it makes people feel very, very frustrated. I think that also in today's day and age where uh, creativity is such a huge uh, advantage that if you are, there's no creativity in a bureaucratic organization. It just gets wrung out of you. It, it, or maybe it just all gets channeled into how to game the system. It, well, exactly. There's some fabulous studies done by an American industrial anthropologist uh, in the late 1940s called Donald Roy, which is a study of machine shop operators in Chicago and how they, how they cheat the piecework system. Yeah, it's amazing how smart they can get about that kind of stuff. Oh, well, of course, all that creativity goes into cheating the system, not thinking of better ways of making products. Right. That's a real colossal waste of time and talent, isn't it? Yeah, that's just a dead weight loss for society at that point. Yeah. So question number five, um, you know, we're really big fans of inverting on this show. And so I thought maybe take the opposite approach here. And what are a few things that that a good manager should stop doing right away to foster a more authentic organization? Uh, one, when something goes wrong, don't invent a new rule. Two, don't say people are our most important assets and then don't practice it. <laughs> yeah. Three. Be clear what the purpose of your business is. What's the purpose of your organization? Uh, four, don't think that the pursuit of the organization of your dreams is a soft and fluffy froth on the cappuccino kind of option. It's, it's actually the coffee. It's the coffee. Build organizations like this and the chances are that you'll be much more successful because as you add value to your employees, you'll find that they add value to customers. Right. That's a kind of win-win situation. Yeah, and I can see too that um, I've seen some, there's a great book by Simon Sinek um, about 
uh, it goes into all the actually the chemicals behind leadership and and people joining organizations. And when they feel safe, they're able to then like look out and take care of others. But when they don't feel safe, they they're just totally inward focused and and worried about themselves. Sure, they, they it's very natural. They're acting very rationally, aren't they? Uh, it, it's a bit like I, I sometimes think um, the most inconsistent things that organizations have said in the last 10 years is, hey, Jake, be creative. Yeah, just go. <laughs> One last instruction. Don't fail. <laughs> utterly, utterly, utterly in tension with each other. If you want to be creative, if you want to be innovative, if you want to be entrepreneurial, you'll have failures. Um, one good test of an organization, I always think, is what happens when something goes wrong. And in healthy organizations, they say, what can we learn from this? And in unhealthy ones, they say, whose fault, whose fault was it? And in very unhealthy ones, they say, whose fault can we make it look like it was? Yeah. Yeah, I imagine VW might be going through a little bit of that right now. It was the engineers. <laughs> yeah, well... All right. Well, Gareth, every time uh, we interview our author, we ask for a book recommendation. So what do you have for us today? Well, I thought about I thought this was a great question, by the way. So I'm going to give you one happy book and one sad book. Well, sort of sad. Uh, the happy book is called The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. Um, you may know it. He's yeah, a, it's a great book. He's a social psychologist. And I think it's a really good book. And I, I love one of the reviews on the back page, which says, I'm the kind of cynical reviewer who takes these kind of self-help books and puts them straight in the bin. But I made myself read it. And guess what? I'm feeling happier. <laughs> I think it's a great result. The other one is, is, a, is a very, very hard read. It's called the, the Long Narrow Road to the Deep North. It won the Booker Prize last year. It's by a Tasmanian author. And it's set in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Uh, and at the same time in a broken love affair in in Australia, and it's a very harrowing read. Uh, I, I was thinking about it for months and months after I finished reading it. However, with hindsight, I now think it's about a really important topic, which is how do you know when you're good? Hmm. Interesting. How do you know when you act morally? Um, so I only recommend that if you're prepared to really commit yourself to the book. Uh, but if you do, I think you'll find it very rewarding. And then a business book, which I think didn't get read widely enough, is by an American jazz musician and business school professor called Frank Barrett. It's called Say Yes to the Mess. And it's business lessons from jazz. Hmm. And in a world where we want to be creative and constantly innovative, just like Miles Davis, then there's much to learn from jazz. Oh, interesting. Well, Gareth, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. I could have talked for longer about the book, and I, I hope people who do get to look at it find it helpful. Uh, I'm sure that they will. I mean, the diagnostics alone are – that's uh, I don't know how much it costs to hire you to be a consultant, but I know that uh, a lot of that is probably baked in there, and it, that's the much better deal probably. <laughs> oh, we do have a more elaborate diagnostic for people who want to take these things further, but um, – uh, we really don't, we want people all over organizations to say, listen, I might not run Walmart, but I do run the vegetable counter. And in the vegetable counter, I'm going to make it a better place to work. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice sentiment, I think, for, for humanity. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gareth, thank you so much. Thanks very much, Jake. Thank you. Yep.